continue this uh, series on Pentecost and, and uh, encountering the Holy Spirit because I do believe and know that we are uh, people of the Holy Ghost. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse 12 through 18 is where we will be going. Uh, last week we talked about power encounters and we uh, use the Corinthian text as kind of the jump off point, if you will, the, the, the source material to remind us that part of what it means to encounter God and to encounter God through the Holy Spirit is to be open to that which is beyond yourself. And to be reminded that for sure there is a, a, a extreme awareness of the material realm or conditions in which our lives are grounded and based and that to be people of the Holy Ghost, people that are moved by the Holy Spirit, it does not mean that we are people who ignore what's going on around us. Hello, somebody. Amen. We are not people of the Holy Ghost, the kind that use religion or our faith as an opiate, as uh, Karl Marx said to the masses, something that is used to distract you from all the many things in the world that God needs and requires us to bear witness to, but that to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to bear witness to the liberating truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that that truth is able to touch every part of your life, from your personal life to your family life, your relationships. It should determine how you work your finances, how you pick your careers, how you act when you pick your careers. Touch your neighbor. Amen. Because how many know you could be a Holy Ghost field employee or you could be a devil field employee? I wish I had a church. You could be a Holy Ghost filled entrepreneur, Holy Ghost filled boss. You could be one of them bosses that everybody be like, you know, I'm coming to church to be free from my boss. <laughs> I mean, no, you don't want to be that kind of boss. Amen. Uh, and I know sometimes folk just hate their bosses because they just, you know, a little trifling. But hopefully, if there's anything in you, <clears throat> hopefully you're not the reason why uh, folk are just filled with all this pain and anger and fear and trauma. And so being people of the Holy Ghost, I hope, will help position us to not only um, uh, have these encounters with God, but make sure that when we encounter others, that that encounter leaves them in a better place than they were before they met us. How many want that? Amen. I, I, I want, after you get done talking and hanging out with me, I don't want you to be like happy to see me come and then happy to see me go. You know, I want, I want you to be like, man, that was, I can't wait to see you. And even if there's some tough conversations we got to have sometimes, uh, I, some of the toughest conversations I, I've had with folk that are filled with the Holy Ghost, I always look forward to hanging out with them a little bit more. Thank God for my wife, of course, being here as well. Let's thank God for her. Amen. All right. Uh, here we go. Second Corinthians chapter number three, verse 12. Uh, it is not lost upon me that uh, this is a, a holiday weekend, a weekend where uh, people are going to be talking about independence and freedom and liberty. And so today I want to talk about liberating freedom, liberating freedom. Second Corinthians chapter 12, uh, chapter three, verse 12 through 18. Uh, this is uh, the Apostle Paul writing another letter to the church in Corinth, mostly because the church in Corinth. Uh, had a little bit of problems with Paul's visit and his first letter. So Paul had to kind of give them uh, another uh, kind of admonition, amen, to clear up some misconceptions. Um, and uh, I don't know about you, but I'm always glad when God puts people in my life that are willing to bear with me when I don't get it the first time amen. or the second time. Do I hear a third time? Amen? All right. All right. I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm sure... <laughs> Oh, I won't keep counting because I don't want to embarrass myself. Amen. Here we go. Verse number 12. Since then we have such a hope, Paul says, we act with great boldness. 
not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. Let me just pause right there, give you a little context. Uh, Paul is talking about Moses. When Moses received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, the scripture says that the presence of the Lord passed by Moses. It was so powerful and overwhelming that God told Moses, let me put you in uh, this cutout of the mountain. <clears throat> because if you were to face my glory and my presence head on, it just like melt you like you just, you couldn't handle it. So God actually hid Moses in a cave of the mountain while he passed by and like nosy we do, he peeked out, so it said, and, and he caught the backside of the presence and the glory of God and it lit his face up so much that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, they had to put a veil over his face because the people of Israel could not look at him. His face was so bright. It was so difficult to behold. So Paul is pulling that image back to the forefront of the readers of uh, this letter's mind to help them realize that uh, we should not be overdetermined by this veil that had to be put on Moses to keep them from gazing and staring at the end of the glory that was being set aside. Verse 14, but their minds were hardened indeed to this very day when they hear the reading of the old covenant, that same veil is still there since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. But, verse 16, when one turns to the Lord, somebody say, turn to the Lord. Turn to the, Lord. the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Some texts say liberty, but it's all about you being free. Verse 18, and all of us, somebody say all of us, all of us. with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord the Spirit. The Word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. I want to speak from the topic today, simply liberating freedom. Bow your heads with me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the Word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this Word in our heart so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Somebody say liberating. liberating. Freedom. Freedom. So again, part of what I am convinced about is that freedom can be just as oppressive if you are not clear about the purpose, source, and function of freedom. Um, that particularly one person's freedom if you go about getting or reaching for your freedom through violence or through exploitation, that freedom could be the source of oppression for so many other people. How many of you ever met someone who was so free that they didn't care about anybody else but themselves? Uh, hopefully that's not true, praise God, amen. I don't know if you're aware of what's at stake when we are not fully kind of wrestling with the underside of freedom. The underside of freedom that this country in particular has been unwilling or dare I say irresponsibly engaging or unleashing for quite some time. Uh, it, it is such a fascinating um, thing when I think about uh, the, icon, the icons of, of, of our country and, 
and the United States of America and how the eagle, the, the bald eagle is, is, is like the, the, the image or the, the symbol of American kind of power and prestige. And, and we're not the only country that has used the, the eagle. We're not the only empire that's used eagles. Um, we're not the only people or culture that use eagles. But it is so fascinating to me how eagles, particularly in the way it's employed in our country, speaks to a kind of independence, a kind of, of majesty, a kind of power, a kind of, 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 of longevity, if you will. And, and as I was looking at the many ways in which uh, eagles and, and these notions of liberty are even being awoken during not only uh, these past few presidential administrations, um, I, I, I just oppose that with another bird, if you will, that is also a symbol of another institution that we are all simultaneously a part of, and that's called the church. And I think about uh, how uh, our bird symbol, if you will, is a dove, um, which signifies and points to uh, the Holy Spirit and, and, and the power. And, and certainly the Holy Spirit is an eternal presence. Amen. It is something that has longevity. But the dove is not something that depends on might and force uh, in order to have its way, his way, right? The Holy Spirit depends on fire, amen, and, and abiding presence, and, and dare I say, its connection to uh, the eternal God uh, of creation, the, the one and only God of Jehovah. It, it is so fascinating as I think about our current moment, how perhaps one of the great challenges of the church is that we are caught between our loyalty to the eagles versus the dove. And, and, and could it be that the greatest enemy of freedom and liberty is our patriotic loyalty to an eagle rather than our heart-transformed um, allegiance to this dove? Uh, to the ways of God that always push back against the ways of this world. A world and a time and a place that only knows how to use violence and force in order to secure and sustain liberty and freedom versus uh, the, the ways of this dove or the spirit that really depends on transformation and conversion and love and hope in order to sustain and expand uh, its impact and its influence. Could it be that part of what we are being called to in this moment uh, when many and all of us included will celebrate uh, Independence Day on this or the next day, uh, we are also being invited to liberate freedom from the notion of liberty that is only about patriotic uh, celebration and or the use of force and, 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 and pain and, and imperialism in order to maintain, sustain, or grasp for power. Part of what I want to submit to you and I today is when you and I have an encounter with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will set you free, but it won't turn you into a tyrant. The Holy Spirit will liberate you, but it won't allow your liberation to be an occasion to oppress someone else. Huh. And this, this, is, this is an important message, I think, for the church of Christ in the world, particularly the United States today, because there are so many people uh, who are, uh, I think, confused about where our loyalties are to lie. I mean, you know, uh, we talk a lot about historic Christianity. Y'all know that I'm a big proponent. I love the patristic mothers and fathers of the Christian faith. The, those uh, uh, folks largely 
you know, African uh, folk from, uh, that were embedded in parts of the Roman Empire from Egypt and from Ethiopia and from you know, Carthage and all these different places. And, and so you know, when, when I read their, their works, I'm so, I'm so filled with uh, awe and wonder at how even in the middle of a religion uh, kind of uh, nestling in the context of empire, they were able to still develop and, and commentate and create these theological frameworks that spoke to the liberatory power of the Holy Spirit through the work of Jesus on the cross. And I think it's that same kind of power that you and I have to be willing to tease and tap into. Because there is a false religion in the land that is being named Christian. And I think that you and I have to start to uncouple a little bit of this false religion lest we get mixed up with some folk who say Jesus but don't mean Jesus. Wish I could talk to somebody. I mean, we have some precedents with this, amen. Uh, in the in the in the in the in the uh, oh, is it Deuteronomy or maybe it's Exodus, maybe it's Numbers, amen. Just pick one of them. I don't know. And 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 on their way on their way out of the the bondage of of Egypt, if you will, uh, they they were on their way to the Promised Land, uh, but the text says that they had with them a mixed congregation. And, and this mixed congregation was uh, some folk who, who, who experienced some of the bondage of Egypt and were hopeful for the experience of the promised land, but they did not fully believe in the one who brought them out of Egypt and was leading them to the promised land. And so halfway through their journey, they started to grumble and they started to complain. And in their grumbling and their complaining, they started to turn the hearts of those who were fixed on the promised land and started to re-narrate, mm -mm -mm. Egypt wasn't as bad as they said. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know, that, I know the Egyptians, you know, was cracking us upside the head and whatnot. But, you know, at least we had some food to eat. At least, you know, uh, you know, we had some shelter. We out here in the middle of the wilderness and we, 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 we don't have no sense of where we're going. We following a cloud in the day and a fire at night. And I don't know, I'd rather go back to Egypt. And we kind of got a similar narrative happening today. Folks feel like we got to make America great again. You know, we got to go back to a time because, you know, it wasn't that bad back then. And they'll use or at least refer to their Christian faith as a roadmap to reify that history that was, was a source of bondage even for them. That's why you got to be filled with the Holy Ghost a little bit, amen, and be in a community that is committed to the liberating of both the soul and the body. Because there's always some folk in the history of our church tradition and nation that have been able to hold the tension between the Jesus that is taught and preached and the Jesus that is often domesticated by the empire. Mm-hmm. Now, lest you get too, you know, high and mighty, uh, let's just remember that we often domesticate Jesus in our own lives as well. Man, because, you know, when you're really trying to follow Jesus, how many know he upsets your life? I wish I could talk to somebody. Amen. Ooh, you got these folks, boys, like, oh, me and Jesus, we just have a good time every day, all day. And we, me and you, we agree on everything. I'm just so in tune with Jesus. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out, well, maybe, 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 maybe you blocking out the part of the voice of Jesus that's supposed to be disrupting your life. Mm -hmm. Because as long as you are alive, how many know you got some disruptions that Jesus would want to do in your life? You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell him Jesus want to disrupt your life. Amen. He, 
Jesus is just not trying to leave your life intact as it is. Lord, I wish I could preach in here to somebody. Mm. Lord, I'm, I'm scared of that disruption sometimes. Sometimes I like my life. With all its messiness, all its contradictions, all its idiosyncrasies, all its conundrums, all of its enigmas, sometimes I like my life. Just the way it is. <laughs> Jesus, you stay over there. Hallelujah. And I'll be right on over here. And when I need you, I'll see you on a Sunday. Amen. I'll see you when I get into a little bit of a mess. <laughs> mm. Do I have a witness in here today? How many know Jesus ain't a part-time Savior? Amen. Jesus like, if I'm a Savior, I'm going to save you from everything. That's that freedom. When we liberate freedom, we allow freedom to not be our tool, but to be the actual tool that frees us. And it is so important to appreciate that there have always been moments where we have needed these prophetic voices to expose to us the contradictions. Uh, I, I pulled this quote from Frederick Douglass, particularly around the 4th of July, and he was talking about, uh, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year the gross injustices and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To the slave, your celebration is a sham. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, people like to pull a lot of our, you know, uh, civil rights or human rights uh, 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 profits and pull them out of their Christian faith. But I want you to know that these folk, by their own confession, were followers of Jesus. So, you know, you got some folk alive at the same time where some folks are using their Christianity to oppress others and others were using their Christian faith as a source of liberation. And it's important for you and I to know that we are always existing in a place where there's a battle for the truth of the gospel. So on a day when some people want to use Christian faith to take us back to a time where not everybody's life or personhood or dare I even say existence was considered a blessing you got to be one of these folks who stand up loud and proud today and be the Frederick Douglass in your circle of influence hallelujah that no one uh, uh, voice of uh, oppressive Christian faith should be able to speak without your voice counteracting or at least bearing witness. So that person that will try to make the, the quote-unquote person deemed as a criminal feel like their life is not valuable because they've ran afoul to human law needs to always be reminded by that voice who can remind them that Jesus came to set the captive free and that whom the son sets free is free indeed. That voice that will always try to make you think that God is the God of the United States government. You need to be that voice that reminds people that the earth is the Lord's. Hello, somebody. That God don't prefer the U.S. government over the Iraqi government over the, 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 the Colombian government over, over the English government over the, 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 the Ghanaian government. All of these governments, amen, require some accountability to the ways of Jesus. And guess what? The church is there to be the voice that reminds everyone that Jesus requires you 
to be just and to love mercy and to walk humbly and to be open to this kind of liberating freedom. So what then gets in the way of us liberating freedom? What gets in the way of us, you know, not not allowing freedom to have its free course? Well, the first thing that uh, I think the text lifts up for us is that often freedom is turned into an idol. And so in order for you to liberate freedom, you got to get rid of your idols. Somebody say no more idols. Now, it's interesting in this text, uh, I, I gave you a quick exposition about it in verse number 13, where Paul refers to Moses having this veil over Moses' face because the glory of the Lord was so strong that it caused a glow, a, 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 a radiance from Moses that made people look at Moses and the manifestation of the glory rather than the source of the glory. And how many of you know, as it says in verse number 13, that they gazed at the end of the glory that was being set aside? That often you and I can turn an idol or turn our glory or that which God has done or manifested in our lives into an idol. And we can focus on that rather than the source. Hello, somebody. Rather than the source of that which creates this goodness and this truth and this healing in our lives. I mean, it makes me want to talk a lot in a few of these, these moments I have about idolatry. And how we, in our pursuit of God's glory, can turn that which is considered or given to us as a gift or tool into an idol that distracts us from God. So some folks say, well, Pastor Mike, when you talk, you sound like you are anti, you know, the United States. I'm like, well, I'm not anti the United States. I'm just pro Jesus. So as long as the United States, you know, act like Jesus, we're going to be cool. Touch your neighbor. But how many know there ain't been a day in the history of the United States? I wish I could talk to somebody. So that's why I mean the United States can be at odds from time to time. But how many know uh, that kind of that kind of clarity also again needs to be 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 applied to our own lives as well? What are the things in our lives that we have turned into idols? Things that we gaze at, things that we are so fixated upon, things that mesmerize us. And, and God is trying to get us to put that aside, but we stuck on that thing. We, I mean, we stuck in a rut on that thing. And that thing is keeping you from being able to liberate freedom in your life. To unleash freedom. Maybe a past hurt. And you've allowed that past hurt to be so radiant in your life. That can't nobody even look at you because they see that hurt. Or maybe, you know, your pride. Or it may be your temper. Or it may be your selfishness. Your trifling ways. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. How many of us know we got idols that we got to deal with in our lives? Because if we don't deal with these idols, we will be reaching for that which, as the prophet says, has no eyes to see us, has no hands to help us. And we will find ourselves in the moment where we need the payoff for all that time we spent investing in that idol. That idol will give us nothing but what it's always given us, insufficiency. We got to lose our idols, our country.
country, this country, our culture, this city, we have to lose our idols. Because God is trying to set aside that which was intended to be temporary. Hello, somebody. Y'all know temporary things don't last always. That goes without saying. But ain't it something how we'll build our whole life around something that's intended to be temporary. We'll build our whole person, our whole plans. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them you got to lose your idols. 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 So, 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 so here's the question. What has you gazing and mesmerized? What in your life has you stuck? Every time God does something for you, every time God gives you a word, every time God challenges you to move beyond this comfort zone or this space, every time a blessing comes your way, every time your calling or your anointing or your assignment starts to emerge, you get stuck. That's an idol. Whatever it is, it could be your husband, it could be your wife, it could be your boo, it could be your kids, it could be your finances, but whatever it is, That keeps you from being able to move forward. God said, I'm trying to set it aside. Hmm. Second thing that keeps us from liberating freedom, we have to lose our veils. Somebody holler, lose your veil, lose your veil. Uh, Verse number 16 says, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Somebody shout hallelujah for that. Now your task is not to put the veil back on. God takes it off. You put it back on. God takes it off. You put it. And many of us, this is our daily exercise with God. It's just... and, 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 and God sometimes be like, okay, I'm going I'm to leave you alone for a couple months. Because <laughs> obviously you're not ready to lose your veil. The veil is there to block you from seeing the, 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 the presence because the presence was too much. The veil serves as a filter for the person wearing the veil so they can also see, because, you know, Moses had to see through the veil. If you keep reading the text, it says they are reading the scriptures with this veil in place so they can't fully get the whole story. I want you to think about this for a second, because we got some veils in the United States of America. I was reading this or watching this crazy NRA ad that these folk put out this week that literally calls for people to 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 push back against some of us. I don't know. Some of y'all may have voted for Trump. I don't know. So I'm gonna say some of us (laughs) who are out here. Let them tell it. China disrupt and push back and and cause uh, uh, insurrection and a, and an uprising and so this ad claims that the only solution is the NRA which seems to suggest that folk need to go get some weapons and get ready to come do some things to folk who may not agree with them. And I was just, I was fascinated by this because, you know, people, people are kind of losing their minds a little bit these days. For, you know, and keep it real, I'm losing my mind. Some days I gotta pray and go find my mind. When I see these folk out here shooting our young girls, this, this, guy, this guy shot this young girl in the head and killed her. I'm trying to figure out, Lord, what are, you, what, are you, what, are you, what are you up to with this stuff? Well, I mean, are you you're trying to, you know, because I often say, you know, God's trying to push you to the edge of your mind so you can change your mind. 
So I'm like, you got me on the edge now. I'm trying to figure out what, what, what trying to change you trying to do in me. Man, because you don't want my mind to change too much, praise God. It may be a lost cause up in this joint. Madness is unleashed in the earth. I don't know there's been madness in all these days we've been alive, but it just feels so palpable today. Why? Because there's some people who have these veils. And they see in the world through race and white supremacy and gendered oppression and 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 was it patriarchy and misogyny and and, and 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 all these different different ideological uh, constructs and they are veils on people's eyes and it's keeping your freedom bound. But the scripture says when you turn to the Lord, he removes the veil. What is it about the church in America that we don't want to lose these veils? Lord, I just wonder sometimes, is the church in America really the church? Are we just some cult that just... Just, just, just do church-like things. We meet every week to remind ourselves how great we are. How great our country is. How great our race is. How great our money is. How great we are. And we add a couple songs. We have someone up talking, regurgitate that to us. And then we walk out and we go out and live that out every day. Or is God trying to take some veils off of us so you can see the whole thing much more clearly? I, again, want to pull out some folk who I think we're trying to get it right. And this Fannie Lou Hamer. I love Fannie Lou Hamer. She's somebody. And, man, she's tough. I'd be, I wouldn't want to go up against no Fannie Lou Hamer. Many folk, I mean, don't name her as a Christ follower, but Fannie Lou Hamer, by her own words... One of these folk who were following Jesus. And this is what Fannie Lou said. We are fighting these people because we love them. And we're the only thing that can save them. I tell you what. And if, if you kept reading this speech that she was given in 1964, she was talking about, you know, uh, how hatred and racism is not supposed to be named or intelligible or reflective of those who are children of God. Now think, I, I, I'm going to tie this into the Eucharist real quick because today we're going to remind ourselves of the sacrifice of Jesus, the body and the blood of Jesus, and we're going to eat food together in this practice, in this sacramental practice. And I love Fannie Lou Hamer. I was reading you know, a lot of her stuff this week and, and how she started a farm. She bought up all these acres of land and she uh, 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 allow people of all races, black, white, to come and plant crops on her farm. And that's how they ate. They had, she had a pig farm as well, so you could rent a pig. I mean, we, we ain't got to talk about, you know, you know, the health stuff just yet, because when you're hungry, amen, you get the health later, amen. <laughs> so they, they, they would get the pig, and, 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 and you could, you know, produce a pig and then the once the pig you know gave you a baby you give the pig back so everybody else could use the pig so you had this woman who bought land to create food for everybody that's a eucharistic practice operating not out of scarcity but out of abundance why because she lost her veil. See, our country's culture would make you and I think that we don't have enough. So we got to hoard everything to ourselves. But when you lose the veil, you'll realize that there ain't nothing to hoard because there's always enough. But when you don't believe there's enough, you're going to start dividing all these folk up into categories of worth and value. 
so you can justify why you got a lot and why they got nothing. Hello, somebody. But God is trying to remove some veils. Wouldn't it be something if the church of Jesus Christ was known in the wealthiest country in the world? Let's forget about trying to end poverty in the world. How about we just end poverty and hunger in the United States? Can you imagine what it would look like if we stopped spending all this money on wars, police, jails, prisons, militarized equipment? Folk telling me why we need all this stuff. Because you believe in a gospel of fear and scarcity. Not a gospel of love and abundance. So God, help me to remove this veil that makes me see the world in such limited ways. What is the veil in my relationship? What is the veil with my children? What is the veil that God necessarily is calling to be removed? Here's a question then. How do your assumptions, biases, preferences blind you from liberating freedom? What are the veils that you must remove? And I got a better one for you. How do you know when you're being deceived? How do you know if this veil is on your eyes? Because some of us, you know, we like our lies. We've built a whole life around our lies. But I believe God's trying to set us free a little bit. We're going to celebrate Independence Day, but are you really independent? From the failing ways of this world. God said, I want to remove some veils. Last thing, and then we'll take a few moments to remember the Lord's Supper. You remove the idols, you lose the veils. Third thing, you move from glory to glory. Freedom is liberated when freedom becomes about transformation. We are only as free as we are willing to be changed. Yeah. Scripture says that we who have experienced this freedom are seeing with unveiled faces the glory of God as reflected through a mirror. How many of you have ever went through a, a, a one of those house of mirrors? And 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 I think we, we took our daughter through one of them. You did. She came. The kid was freaked out. She didn't know what was going on. She <laughs> didn't know where she was going. And 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 the house of mirrors became a house of horror, <laughs> which is deep because sometimes. Seeing too much of yourself can be a scary thing. <laughs> this is kind of like, I, I don't need to be surrounded by myself now. I, I don't need all these reflections. I wish I had an honest church in here. Anybody, anybody honest like, I don't need a lot of reflections. I don't need to be surrounded by me all the time. Because there's something wrong with me now. <laughs> Give your neighbor a high five and tell them it ain't that much wrong, but just you, know, you got you got a few little things here, amen. A few little things. And when you surround yourself with only yourself, how many of you know you won't change? I'm about to mess with y'all. I'm about to mess with your bad. If the only people you around are people who are like you. They look like you. They think like you think. They like what you like. Eat what you eat. Dress what you wear. What you wear. How many of you not gonna change? I don't mean no harm. I don't mean no harm. The scripture says that they started to move from glory to glory. 
being changed into the image of God. Difference is a catalyst for our transformation. And when you and I, as followers of Jesus, become too homogenous, that we just only gather in around everybody that agrees with everything we do, you will not change. And the scripture that says you are reflected through the mirror, you will become a house of horror rather than a house of hope. So what does it mean then for you and I to be committed to change and transformation? Moving from glory to glory. Moving from place to place. That you and I are being transformed not into something arbitrary because I'm not even trying to be changed into you. Now, let's be clear. Because there's nothing, you know, you, you good, you cool, you great. But by yourself, you are as insufficient as me. Because God did not create the whole world full of me's. If God did, then that would be a sign that I am quite the bomb. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Be the same for you. I know we all got our doppelganger, our twin or something. You know, I go play. I, I, I seen you before. I don't think you seen me. I ain't never been here before. Amen. But how many of you know God wants God's church to see through this mirrored reflection of difference as a occasion to move from glory to glory? Move from the house of horrors to the house of hope. That your story, your journey of God's liberating power creates hope. That's why we got to stay together. I know we don't agree on everything, but you don't agree on everything with yourself. <laughs> How many of you say what I was sure about last week, I'm not so sure about today? <laughs> Amen. I was sure last week that I was going to get this raise. Now I'm in the unemployment line. It's like a quick, you know. So we as the church have to figure out, you have to figure out, how do you overcome the differences? And allow difference to help catalyze through the spirit, our transformation from glory to glory. I'll close with a quick reflection back to Azusa Street, the Pentecostal revival of the 20th century that we talked about several weeks ago and how in this place and space, white, black, Latino, Asian, international, folks from all over the world were drawn to a place of radical difference and inclusion. And the Holy Spirit was moving so powerfully that even newspapers and people who weren't necessarily followers of Jesus were noticing how the color line had been washed away in the blood of Jesus. That kind of public, ex, uh, public expression was so compelling to the world that the world stopped and took notice. And I want to suggest to you today that in this moment of extreme tension and divisiveness and violence and, 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 and antagonism. May we be a picture and a model of multiracial and multigendered and, and, and just multi-everything. We don't lose our distinctiveness, but we don't build an idol out of our distinctiveness. We don't let that distinctiveness be the veil by which the whole world is predetermined nor do we allow our distinctiveness to be a homogenous reality. But we say, I'm going to move from glory to glory. Because in the movement, I think that that is creating by God's spirit the image of the uncreated one, Jesus, the God of all creation. Come on, stand with me, everybody.